Uh, let's get to some callers. Let's go to uh, the Car- uh, Caribbeans. Christine, it's your turn, 806. Hello, Mr. Mazzaro. Hi. It's so great to be speaking with you again. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, calling in, and uh, uh, it's good to hear from you. Well, before I have two questions this time, but before I get into those, I would just like to say that in regards with Michael's death, the thing that really hurt me most is the fact of knowing that he went through so much emotional pain and I had no way of reaching out to him in a more direct manner. I had to settle for doing it from a distance, and I didn't feel like I accomplished anything doing that. And though people have told me many times, you know, it's not my fault, you know, be out of myself, I still have trouble forgiving myself completely, you know, because I still feel as if I have failed him. Well, listen, uh, you, we can only do so much in life. We're only human. You know, we have our limitations. Um, I'm sure your thoughts uh, and your prayers uh, meant a lot to him, uh, uh, whether he actually knew you were doing it or not. You know, this is a, I believe, very strongly in a spiritual side of life. Uh, I believe that Michael was a very spiritual person, a very humanist kind of individual that the, what the world really sees. And uh, your thoughts and your um, uh, your prayers for him, uh, I think, have had great meaning, and I don't think you should feel guilty at all. You did your very best. With with, uh, with where you are and what you have, uh, you did your very best. So I would not uh, knock yourself like that. Well, um, thank you so much. Your reassurance means a lot. Well, my questions are... Um, what do you think of how AEG people were being such controlled freaks to Michael and also given the amount of lies Conrad Murray had been caught in thus far, would you be surprised at all to learn that he told Michael a bunch of lies when he was treating him? Well, let's start with the uh, with the Conrad Murray. I mean, I, I don't have great regard for him. Um, I think he really sold out his medical license. I think he violated medical ethics. I think, like so many people, he uh, he got carried away with fame and money and carried away with being close to Michael Jackson, and uh, he was very selfish and very greedy, uh, very narcissistic. Um, and I don't think he uh, he should be practicing medicine, and I think he caused the death of Michael Jackson. Uh, as I said before, I, I don't want to just keep knocking this person, you know, forever. I think it's time to move on. He he served his time. He lost his license. He's desperately trying to rebuild his life by being paid for these interviews, and he does have children to take care of. So um, I'd rather not deal with Conrad Murray, but he keeps surfacing with these goofy, you know, ridiculous interviews. Uh, do I think he lied to him? Yes. I mean, I, I don't know if he did. I was, I've never met Conrad Murray. I wasn't there. But I have to believe that on some level, he must have made Michael think that taking propofol was appropriate. Uh, I'm not a witness to any of this, but, I mean, how could you order gallons of propofol and bring it into his home and administer it the way he did, um, you know, without, you know, giving poor advice to Michael? I, I know he says he was weaning him off of it, but I think what he did was a disaster. Um so do I think he lied to him about his course of medical treatment? Maybe he convinced himself that what he was doing was appropriate. I just don't know. I'm forever, forever surprised by the way people justify things to themselves that are very inappropriate. So I don't know if he lied to him. He may have just been totally incompetent, totally bedazzled by fame and money, and convinced himself that this was the proper thing to do and that he was going to be a hero to Michael Jackson. I just don't know. As far as AEG is concerned, you know, that jury unanimously found that AEG had hired Conrad Murray. Uh, There were some emails that uh, appeared quite harsh uh, to me where they basically are pressuring Murray to bring him to rehearsal. Uh, There was one email, as I recall, that uh, they wanted Murray to be reminded who's paying his bills. And my sense was that AEG was really cracking the whip to get him to rehearse and to get him to perform um, in what was going to be the greatest comeback in entertainment history. So do I think they treated him harshly? Yes, I do. Uh, Do I think they ignored some of the signals that that Michael was uh, not well? I do. 
I think they also may have convinced themselves that Michael just was lazy and didn't want to rehearse and that kind of thing. I, as I recall, there was testimony in the case to that effect. But um, I think they treated him very harshly. I think they had big business uh, ideas that uh, required just one more thing, and that was Michael Jackson going to London and performing uh, the way he always would perform. And I also think they knew Michael well enough um, to know that Michael had a philosophy of performance, and that was that the show must go on. Michael was known to just perform magnificently, even if he wasn't feeling well, even if he was injured. There was one time in his, his career where he had a serious back injury, and uh, he performed brilliantly anyway. Um, and they probably thought if we can just get him to London, get him to rehearse, and get him on stage, uh, he'll he'll get the job done the way he always did. And uh, it was all very sad and very unfortunate for all of us and, and his family. And, you know, uh, a, a wonderful human being should not have died. Uh, do I think Murray exploited him. I think AEG exploited him. Um, as I say, they may have convinced themselves that what they were thinking and doing was correct. Um, but it was just a, a, just a disaster, the whole thing. Oh, okay. Um, I hope somehow you and I could become friends somehow, even though the distance is very great for now. Well, that's very nice of you. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a busy person and you're a busy person. It might be difficult, but at any rate, um, uh, it'd be nice to meet you someday and I wish you the very best and I hope you stop feeling guilty, uh, and realize you're a human being and you've done your very, very best. And thank you for the call, and we appreciate that. Let's go over to Puerto Rico, uh, 787. Uh, please state your name and uh, what you want to talk about. Hi, I, uh, my name is Daniel. And well, I just wanted to say um, it's great to, to talk to you, Mr. Mesero. It's a great honor. And, um, well, what I wanted to bring up was um, Aphrodite Jones again. Now, I understand and I agree with what you're saying that, you know, she may not have investigated the Jordan Chandler case. And, of course, she has she has the rights to have her doubts. But I found that the reason why so many fans are upset with her is because in regards to June Chandler's testimony, she wrote a passage in her book that basically said, um, to summarize it, said, um, she says that the jurors were unimpressed and that, you know, no, that, that her, her testimony was unconvincing. That's basically what she wrote in her book. Mm-hmm. And now for her to say what she's saying now, it's like she's doing an about face. And that is, what, that is mainly why people are upset with her because she says one thing when she wrote the book and now she's saying a completely different thing. So I just well, wanted to know what your opinions are on that. Well, again, I'm, uh, you know, I'd like to give her the benefit of the doubt because she did such a great service to, to all of us when she, you know, was relentless in her desire to set the, you know, the, get the truth out about the trial, which the publishing industry didn't want, and she wanted to do. So um, I haven't read that, that section in her book for quite a while, um, I remember talking to some jurors who were not very impressed with June Chandler. There was one female juror who actually told me after the trial that she thought um, Michael was um, uh, infatuated with June, the thought that June took advantage of that. Um, but clearly, June Chandler's testimony did not sway this very conservative jury in this very conservative uh, courthouse. Um, but again, um, if Aphrodite, you know, has thought about that testimony and, you know, has some concerns about it, uh, which she admits she's never thoroughly investigated and has not reached any conclusions about, you know, I wouldn't deny her, you know, the right to express her reservations uh, as long as she says, but I, I really don't know. I haven't, you know, spent time looking into that. Um, so, I, again, I can understand why fans are upset but I also think you've got to, uh, you know, understand that she did everybody a great service. And she told me she hasn't reached any conclusion about the Chandler case at all. 
but she was bothered by some of the testimony. Um, I don't know what else I can tell you. Uh, I just hope people will continue to read her book, Michael Jackson Conspiracy, because I think it's an important book. Um, I agree. But my other question, I guess, would be about, um, well, it's actually two other questions. I don't know how I could, how I could, how I should word this, but, uh, I guess one would be about Wade Robson, or Robson, however you pronounce his name. Um, there's been, uh, you know, he's made his, um, interview on the Today Show back in May, I believe. Right. And since then, he's been quiet. But then, of course, over this, these um, last several months, he's um, made um, other statements, you know, talking about, like, for instance, when the, when, um, the Sunday people posted that ridiculous FBI file story um, about, you know, how supposedly Michael paid off 24 families or something to that effect, and, of course, it was discredited, but then, of course, Wade jumped in to say that, oh, this proves that my allegations are true. And then once that story was proven false, he stayed quiet, and then he, then later he makes a story saying that Michael is responsible for his father's deaths, and then something, and then these other bizarre stories. Now, um, I'm just wondering if how much you've been following the that situation or... Um, what uh, your opinions are in regards to this man's credibility or what you remember when you saw him in in person in well, 2005. When I first met Wade Robson, he was with his mother and his sister, and they were all very, very pro-Michael Jackson. Uh, Wade impressed me as a very intelligent, very articulate, uh, very sensitive, mature young man. Uh, who was adamant that he had never been molested or inappropriately touched by Michael at any time. Um, I learned that his mother and sister had traveled with them uh, on numerous occasions. They were equally convinced Michael Jackson never did anything appropriate uh, based on their, you know, discussions with Wade. And I was so impressed with them that I made him my first witness in the defense case. And, you know, the decision to put on a defense case was a difficult one because our cross-examination of the prosecution witnesses I thought had been so effective that I think probably 99% of lawyers would have probably not put on a defense case and just, you know, rested right there, um, thinking there was enough reasonable doubt. My concern was that uh, I made a lot of promises to the jurors, and I felt that we'd probably get a hung jury if I didn't put on a case, and then Michael would be put through a retrial, which would have been difficult. So I made the decision to put on a an extensive defense case. And if you do that, you want to start strong and you want to end strong. And I started with Wade Robson because I thought he was such a powerful witness for us. And he was. You know, our defense case began with Wade Robson and ended with Chris Tucker, two powerful witnesses for Michael Jackson. And I was utterly shocked when I heard that he was now claiming that he had been molested. And... You know, I don't know what their theory is. Is it repressed memory? I, I don't know. At first I was told the lawyers were claiming it was repressed memory, his lawyers. And then he went on the Today Show and, uh, as I recall, said words to the effect that it was not a repressed memory case. Um, but you have to understand, I'm not litigating this case. This case is being litigated by the Michael Jackson estate. And I believe Howard Weitzman is the lead lawyer in that case. Um and I'm told the case is still going on, but I don't know what kind of activity there's been. Uh, I am uh, concerned that the lawyers litigating the case are, you know, Weitzman and Branca because, you know, they were around Michael when he engaged in these other cells. So, um, you know, um, I just hope if it gets to trial, they're willing to walk in and try it. I'm hoping that they can get the case thrown out on either procedural grounds or legal grounds before it ever gets to trial. And those kinds of grounds could have to do with whether or not it was filed too late, whether, you know, the facts are just too thin. I just don't know. I'm not involved in it. I'm not involved in the Michael Jackson estate. I don't represent them. I don't go to their functions. I'm not invited to their functions. I just don't, uh, I don't have anything to do with the estate, so I don't really know what they're up to. 
But I have mm. concerns that these lawyers may just decide to pay money and enter into a confidential settlement and get rid of it, like was done before on two occasions, Chandler and Jason Frenzy. And I, if the word ever got out that that happened again, I think it would be disaster. Um, but I can't tell you what posture the case is in because I'm not litigating it. And I assume that if it ever got to trial, if these lawyers are willing to try it uh, for the estate, I probably would be a witness because I did interview him and call him as a witness. And I'm telling you, I remember Ron Zonin, a really good prosecutor, uh, one of the more effective prosecutors I've ever faced, cross-examining Wade Robson and just getting frustrated and just attacking him. And Wade just, you know, stood his ground and was just, at one point he said, words to the effect, this is, these claims are ridiculous, you know. Um, so I'm just amazed that at this late date he's come out, despite all these contrary statements. But I'm not really involved in that in that lawsuit. Well, uh, um, it's ridiculous to me. I mean, I'm not sure, no, I don't know if you're aware of this, but now even his sister is supporting him, Chantal Robson, her name is. So, yeah. you know, well, it really, yeah, she was really a like, yeah, she was a witness also. So I don't know where they get off doing that. I mean, they so adamantly defended Michael for so many years. Do they really expect people to just buy them what they're saying now? Like they don't have to answer for um, what all their um, defense of him for all these years? And, you know, I thought about it myself. And, you know, I... There's been a lot of discussion in the fan community about why Wade has done this. And, of course, by his own admission, he's not getting much work. He doesn't really have much money to his name. He has a wife and a child to support. And, you know, it it makes, if you really think about his tactics, like, for instance, why he says he was abused for seven years, why he makes this big, long... um date of molestation is because he has to find a way to disavow every single phrase he sung Michael every time he defended him because say for instance he was going to say that Michael molested him after 1993 it wouldn't make sense because Wade defended Michael in the 1993 case so what sense would it have made if um, you know, he defends Michael even after being involved in that sort of case. It doesn't make sense. So, of course, he would say it happened for all these years that he was, quote-unquote, brainwashed. And, um, you know, even if he, and then even thinking of it like that, what sense would it make that Michael would do something to Wade when the eyes of the world are on him? especially during the early 90s. So, See, you know, I don't know, that's just... Again, we have to get back to that disastrous Jordy Chandler settlement and the one that followed with Jason Franzi, which I never knew about till I was already defending Michael. Um, I was able to dig through this evidence. Susan Yu was just magnificent and brilliant in the way she dug through the evidence. And I began to realize that there had been a second settlement, which I hadn't known about. Um, and that was settled not that long after the Chandler settlement. And again, so much of these, so many of these problems get back to the Chandler settlement because that was a tremendous amount of money. Uh, I'm informed that uh, it was invested very wisely and that it tripled in value. So, you know, Mr. Chandler is reportedly very wealthy and uh, you can't tell me that hasn't affected other people like Mr. Robson. I have to assume it has. Um, I just hope they don't settle again, because if these lawyers uh, settle it, uh, it won't be their money that's paid. It will be the estate money that's paid. And if uh, a judge lets it get to trial, they may be too afraid to try it. And then you might have other people come out of the woodwork. Well, if, it, if the word got out... Um, you're absolutely correct, just like, look what happened after the Jordy Chandler settlement. Suddenly, Michael was getting sued left and right, security guards at Neverland, security guards at Havenhurst, 
you know, it just got ridiculous. I think the word got out, why work when you can sue Michael Jackson? You know, he'll pay big money. And right. it was a nightmare. And Michael told me that that Chandler settlement turned out to be a total nightmare for him. Um, and I, you may recall, anyone who followed the trial closely, that before we got to trial, I made a public statement with the judge's permission uh, that um, uh, that these settlements were disasters, that uh, Michael regretted entering into them, that he was advised by others to do it, uh, that it would make business sense, and he regretted ever doing it. I had to do that to try and deal with this groundswell of public opinion, which essentially said, it, you know, what innocent person would pay this kind of money to settle? Uh, it, was like an albatross, it was an albatross around my neck going into the trial, and then the trial judge, Judge Melville, allowed the prosecution to bring in evidence that he had settled those two cases, Chandler and Franzi. So um, I think this Wade Robson incident, I'm just it's just my opinion, uh, right is an offshoot of that disastrous 1993 Chandler settlement. Uh, again, I want to emphasize, I think his lawyers, you know, Howard Weitzman, Johnny Cochran, John Brank, I understand, was a general counsel, and I think they all thought this was the right way to go. I think they had Michael's interest in mind. I don't think for a second anybody was trying to hurt him. Uh, and I didn't know uh, Michael at the time. I wasn't involved in any of these discussions. Uh, I don't believe it was just Johnny Cochran's idea, like I'm told, Frank and Weitzman are saying. Uh, I think they all decided it was in his best interest. He should get this behind him and move on. And it just turned out that it opened Pandora's box. Uh, suddenly you had our viso and you had, um, you know, I think this is another claim like that. And I just hope it's defended properly. And I hope the judge throws it out before it ever gets to trial. And if a judge doesn't, I just hope these lawyers for the estate have the guts to try the case. I don't know if they do, but I hope they do. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to uh, 505. Please state your name and where you're calling from. 505. Um, Jane Haas, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Yeah, it's an honor, Mr. Mazzaro. Well, thank you. Um, I had a, a question. The book, The Magic, The Madness, The Whole Story by R- <coughs> Randy yeah. Caraborelli, I think you say. Um, Caraborelli. Thank you. Randy J. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've gone through it a couple times, and my impression was that at, at one point he was a friend of Michael Jackson's, and, and he may have been throughout, but I, I felt it was, it was very tainted and especially when he described Michael's relationship with um, Jordy Chandler. And I felt like he sort of sold out um, to get this book into a publisher. And I wanted to get your opinion of Michael's relationship with Randy um, Tarbori <laughs> and the well, book itself. Well, I, I, again, Randy knew Michael many, many years ago when Michael was young and Randy was young. And this was long before I ever met Michael Jackson. I met Michael oh, Jackson at, at the lowest period in his life. Yeah. You know, he was facing horrific criminal charges that could have sent him to prison for a long, long period of time where he may have perished. And um, I did meet Randy Terraborelli, uh in Santa Maria because he was covering the trial. And I didn't talk to him very much uh, during the trial because I wasn't talking very much to anyone in the media. But uh, he did send me his book at one point with a letter, and he recognized that, you know, there had been some, I think what he thought were misinterpretations of what he was saying. Because, uh, mm-hmm. he, you know, he told me, he said he concluded that Michael had not molested Jordy Channel. Um, uh, yeah, but he as does, far as... It, he does come to that conclusion, but... The journey to get there throughout the book, it, it, if you, it, 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 it frames Michael in very, in the wording around Michael's relationship with Jordy and the way, you know, Randy would describe Michael looking at, um, Jordy Chandler. It just made you feel like he had to put these in to get the book sold or something. I, I know at the very end he says, yeah, but he, but he didn't do it, but, I just felt there was so many other ways he could have written the book that were not 
intermittently implicating Michael? Um, you know, I, I haven't read the book in quite a while. Okay. Um, I do have the book, and I've talked to Randy a number of times. He's a very nice guy, and I think uh, considered himself a good friend of Michael, but, you know, wanted to put down, again, a journalist trying to identify yeah. the fact that, that he thought were significant. Uh, he felt, I, I don't remember the exact words he used. I think he felt he was being a little bit misinterpreted by the family. Um, yeah. But... Um, you may want to get a hold of him yourself. You know, he's, he lives in Los Angeles. He's written some yeah. other books. Um, uh, I've bumped into him from time to time, and I think he's a very nice guy and a very, uh, you know, very accomplished writer. Yeah. So I would try and get a hold of him and and just ask him yourself. He, he may just take your call. He may just respond to your letter. Um, but I haven't read his book in quite a while, and I, I don't want to comment on details if I don't have them fresh in my mind. But again, again, this whole Chandler thing... Just because of that 93 settlement, which was such a nightmare, you know, that amount of money being paid just has haunted, you know, this whole perception of Michael. I think it continues to do so, even with the acquittal in 2005, where we addressed all of these issues, not just our visa. We addressed Chandler. We addressed Francia. You know, we, we, we addressed all of these things. Um, California law is very, very pro-prosecution in child molest cases and allows mm-hmm. prosecutors to bring in evidence of similar actions uh, or alleged similar actions, you know, and and, and they thought they could poison the jury um, with evidence about Chandler and Franzia, and they tried to say that Robson and um, uh, Brett Barnes and Macaulay Culkin were molested. We dealt with all of that very effectively, very successfully, and he was exonerated on every single charge, including four misdemeanor charges. I know. So it's a shame that, that this thing just keeps haunting him, but I just think the, the amount of money alleged to have been paid in that settlement continues to tarnish Michael's reputation, and that's why a book like Randall Sullivan, you know, his book Untouchable, where this guy has no bias either way, and, and even talks to the Chandler, to some of the Chandler family members and digs deep into the facts and concludes Michael didn't molest anyone. It's so important that a book like that circulate and be read because he's perceived as an objective journalist. He was a contributing editor to Rolling Stone magazine. And uh, I know the book irritates a lot of people in some places, but I think he meant to be as truthful as he could be. And, um, I know the paperback edition uh, with an update is coming out in March, I believe. And I'm going to, you know, I haven't read the update yet, but I'm sure I'm going to endorse that book again. Um, uh, I just think it's a book that needs to be read. And also David Guest's documentary, you know, Michael Jackson, The Life of an Icon. It's a two-hour, 37-minute documentary. I love the documentary. I think David yes. Guest did a fabulous job. I think every fan should see that documentary. It I did. Randy was good in that too. Randy J. Taylor really was good in that. Yeah, you know, he addresses the the difficult issues in Michael Jackson's life, uh, addresses them head on, um, and uh, you know, people should want the truth. They should want, you know, and they should encourage others to dig for the truth, uh, and not just judge someone harshly because they're not a, a complete fan all the time. We need intelligent, objective journalists to look at the evidence of Michael Jackson's life and reach an objective, you know, detailed, intelligent conclusion that this man was not a pedophile, should never have been labeled as a pedophile, uh, that he was exonerated completely in 2005 when Susan, you and I, you know, didn't settle anything. We took it to trial and he was acquitted. Um, and I would hope that uh, Mr. Robson's, you know, case gets either thrown out or destroyed in a trial. That's what I'm hoping happens. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to 218. Please state your name and where you're calling from. You are live. 218. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is Lynette, and I'm calling from Minnesota. I spoke with yeah. Tom in May about Wade, and um, I'm a psychiatric nurse. I have a couple of questions about the 93 settlement. Uh-huh. Um, was there ever any evidence that it was settled by an insurance company or paid by them? 
Uh, my understanding was an insurance company did not pay. Now, the settlement agreement was written, in my opinion, and again, I was not involved in that settlement. Uh, you mm -hmm. should ask Jeff Weitzman about the settlement or John Branca about it. I was not involved in it. Uh, I didn't even know Michael at the time. I was I didn't meet him until 11 years later. Um, but right. um, my understanding was that the settlement agreement was written to um, permit the possibility that an insurance company would step in and pay, but I was also told that an insurance company did not pay. Oh. That's my okay. understanding. There, there were some people running around saying an insurance company paid it, and that's why it was settled, and uh, my understanding is that's not correct. Well, I think they based that on um, one of the motions that were filed by Brian Oxman. I'm well aware and, of that. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're under the impression that it was paid by an insurance company, and if that's the wrong impression, that's the wrong impression. Um, the that's other not, thing is... That's my understanding. During the... Um, the body search was what was the purpose of the body search and would Michael have been arrested if it would have been a match to Jordan Chandler's description well again I was not a witness to these events uh, I was not involved mm -hmm. in that case and I was not involved in that settlement but <clears throat> at that time you had two grand juries one in Santa Barbara County and one in Los Angeles County investigating um, the Chandler allegation. Um, you had uh, Mr. Snedden and the sheriffs um, going really over the top, in my opinion, to investigate these allegations to see if there was a possible criminal case. And my understanding is that um, part of their investigation was this, you know, physical examination that took place at Neverland under certain conditions that were worked out between Michael's attorneys and the district attorney's office. And yes, I think the, the question was, given Jordy Chandler's alleged description of Michael anatomy, um, you know, did an examination of Michael prove that Chandler was correct or not? That would be the obvious and logical reason for having that kind of a body search and body examination and photographs taken. Uh, as you know, it was very humiliating to Michael Jackson and uh, uh, a horrible experience for him. Uh, and my understanding is that uh, the Chandler's description did not match up. It, 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 I don't like wondering right. anymore than that, but that's my understanding. But again, I was not involved in it. You may want to ask the what who were involved. One of the um, one of the other questions I have is about um, a man by the name of Victor Gutierrez and a book that he wrote. Yeah, a horror. And I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I read it. And um, I, well, I, I, the, I read you. the book too. I read all of these books when I was preparing to defend them, and mm -hmm. it was a horrible book. Uh, as I think you know, Michael won a what a judgment, I believe, against uh, the author, and the I, author then I think fled to South America. I think. But you know, if, when when you read that book, and again, I haven't read it in years. Um, as I recall, he spent a lot of time in the book suggesting that Macaulay Culkin, Wade Robson, and Brett Barnes were molested. And, of right. course, they were my first three witnesses in the trial, and they were absolutely adamant they were never molested. Um, well, Brett Barnes was angry. He came over from Australia. He said, I gave up my job. You know, he said, I angry. think I... Do you think I would be here if I were molested? He was furious. Macaulay Culkin was just beside himself, saying this is just ridiculous. It never happened. And, and Wade Robson was equally beside himself, saying this never happened. Um, well, another thing that, that I found interesting, though, in the book is um, and him and some of the witnesses that they put on in 05, the Neverland Five, um, their connection with Victor, and uh, there's actually a photo in that book of Victor and Blanca Francia together. Um, he seems to be connected with all of these people who 
later sued Michael for money, making some pretty outrageous statements about seeing Michael molest them and molest these kids and and stuff like that. Um, That's sort of an odd coincidence to me that they're all connected to the same man who was found to be, I don't know, quote, uh, guilty of slander. Well, so... I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a horrible book. It's a salacious, disturbing, graphic book uh, that I, th- I think was written to exploit the situation. That's my opinion. Um, and I think the fact that he didn't defend himself and took off speaks volumes about the book. But I read it like I read other negative books about Michael Jackson so I could prepare to defend them. And I've often said that, you know, Gutierrez's book and Raymond Chandler's book, these books really helped me prepare his defense because they gave me all the detail I needed about what the enemy was going to be throwing at us. Wow. Um, they helped me prepare cross-examination. They helped me. I would go through those books bit by bit, and then, you know, Susan, you and I would talk about the response, would talk about the defense. And I designed a lot of my cross-examination of prosecution witnesses from these very negative books. They did me a favor. They just outlined <laughs> all their thought processes. They really did. So that's why I read, as I recall, that was just a disgusting, horrific book. Unbelievable. Okay, let's go to 256. Please state your name and where you're calling from. You're next. 256. Hi, this is Raven Woods from Alabama. Hi, Raven. Hey, Tom. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, I've been lately uh, researching a lot of other celebrity uh, pedophile cases, like the, the recent Ian Watkins case out of the U.K., which I'm sure you've probably heard about. Uh, wow. One thing that really stands out to me is that in, in all of these cases, which, of course, have led to convictions, there's always a smoking gun, okay? There's always, like, you know, they've actually found a videotape or there are text messages that they've sent to some child or there's, you know, evidence on their computer, you know, especially, like, in the Ian Watkins case. I mean, it was just, it went on and on and on, the stuff that they actually found. And it seems interesting that, you know, when you look at Michael Jackson's case, it's always it seems to me then he said, she said, you know, it's like there's never, never been any actual hardcore evidence. But that being said, okay, when I read a lot of the hater sites, which I do read those because I like to keep a balanced view, um, they do like to, I think, twist and distort a lot of the, the evidence that was found, like, for example, the art books, uh, they try to portray that as child pornography. Uh, a lot of the pornography that was found in Michael's home at Neverland, uh, they have tried to distort that into, you know, that he was using that to groom boys, even though a lot of it was heterosexual porn. Um, and a lot of this I pretty much dismissed because I know what their agenda is. But there is one piece of evidence that keeps cropping up that they mention a lot, and I wanted to ask you about that. There, uh, in 1993, I believe, when they raided Neverland, there was a photograph of a boy said to be Jonathan Spence. And, I mean, there's different variations. Some, some of these sites say, oh, the boy was in his underwear. Some say it was a completely new photo. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, what is your take on this, and if... Michael actually at any time had a new photo of a child he actually knew, whether it was Jonathan Spence or anybody else. Why wouldn't he have been arrested then? Well, first of all, your perception that there was no forensic evidence linking Michael Jackson to any act of molestation is correct. Uh, I recall in my closing argument in the Michael Jackson criminal case telling the jury there was no DNA there was no hair evidence or fiber evidence. There were no stains. Uh, there was nothing of a, of a forensic nature that tied him into any act of molestation. 
Um, the second thing you raise are those books, which are just utter, utterly ridiculous to, to argue that these books were the mark of a pedophile. First of all, we prove that Michael Jackson had numerous editions of Playboy and Penthouse magazines. You know, I called them early magazines. Um, uh, that he was having up to buy for him. Um, in fact, I remember now Macaulay Culkin testifying that as a boy he used to hide uh, an edition of Playboy under his bed, and people were kind of amused by that. Well, Michael used to read these magazines all the time. Uh, there were two books, I believe, that were sent to him by, I think, fans. One of them was The Life of a Boy in Pictures, there were a couple of nude pictures of the boy who's the subject of the book, but they're, you know, but, but they were just very harmless, innocuous pictures, and most of them were not naked pictures, and just went through the life of a boy growing into a man. And uh, it was a perfectly harmless book that was sent to him. But there was another book sent to him by a fan, a similar type of book, as I recall, that was very harmless in nature. It was not some act of pornography. Um, and I, I, as I recall, I think the fan had an inscription in it. And then there was a famous photographer. Uh, I don't remember if he was Italian or what, who I believe had sent him a book of homoerotic art, uh, again, unsolicited by Michael, just sent to him in the mail. So you had these three books in the middle of, you know, a 100,000 other books. <laughs> and they tried to make this look like the mark of a pedophile, and it just was ridiculous, and the jury rejected it. As far as nude photos of uh, Jonathan Spence or anyone else, I never saw them. And I will guarantee you that if the prosecution had them, they would have sought to introduce them, because remember, the trial judge let them bring in evidence that other young men had been molested going back to the early 90s. He even allowed them to bring in evidence that young men had been molested without bringing those young men in. You know, they put on security people from Neverland who had sued Michael and lost uh, and were very bitter about it, in my opinion. Uh, they had them testify they saw uh, Macaulay Culkin being molested. You know, they saw Robson and, and, and Barnes being molested. And then, of course, we started our case with Robson, Calkin, and Barnes all saying he never touched us, you know. Um, so this judge was, was very liberal for the prosecution and letting them go way, way back to the early 90s and bring in any evidence of molestation they could find. And I don't recall any such photos being in their possession. It certainly wasn't in ours. And if they had had such photos, in my opinion, they would have asked the judge to let them bring them into evidence. They would have said, we found them at Neverland. Neverland. They, they, um, uh, uh, they help us prove our case. The judge probably would have let them bring it in. So that's my response. Hello? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Thanks for calling.